to Rotoma Park Baptist Church. If you'd please stand, let's join the heavens in praising our Lord. seated for a few minutes. Good morning. Good morning. It is great to be with you today as we worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And we want to welcome you today if you're visiting with us. And if you're visiting with us for the first time and you've never filled out a visitor's card for us, there's, there should be a visitor's card in the in the seat in the back of the pew right in front of you it's got uh, a red you got red ink on it but if, if you'd uh, do us a favor and and fill that out for us so we can follow up with you later and and just to see how how we can also be a blessing and pray that you would come come join us again here here very soon but uh, just drop that uh, that welcome card in the uh, offering plate as it comes by and that'll be your gift to us uh, but uh, we just want to praise God for just the opportunity to serve him and worship him today uh, we want we want to also remember uh, uh, at the top of the top of the service here. Uh, Stacy Naren is still hanging in there. Um, if you uh, uh, don't know, uh, Marsha, uh, Marsha and Stacy are, are, are members here, and uh, Stacy's on a ventilator here at the the hospital, uh, dealing with complications from COVID. Uh, but uh, it's been a, it's been a rough week for Marsha and the family. Uh, so I'm very thankful for all of you who've been bringing meals, and I know that's got at least another week on that uh, as, as she's got family in in town. So be, just to continue to lift up uh, Stacy and Marcia and the whole family uh, in prayer right now. Um, got a got a busy day today. Um, of course, yesterday was September 11th, and we um, I know that we had had a number of folks uh, here yesterday uh, praying, and then I know a number of folks also went down uh, to the. The, the service that was down at Turcotte uh, following that. So very thankful as we think about 20 years since, since that sep- September 11th. It's uh, pretty remarkable. Um, but we uh, are so thankful and we do honor the memory of all those who, uh, who bravely gave their lives uh, serving on that day and in the, in the years following. 
in the, in the various uh, theaters, whether in Afghanistan, Iraq, whatever it might be. We, we just praise God for all the service that people went through uh, in, in defense of our freedoms in, in, in the aftermath of that. Um, today, um, busy day, big day, fun day in a lot of ways, but also a challenging day. Uh, business meeting today at, at, at September uh, uh, at 5 p.m. today, this afternoon. Um, if you haven't already picked one up on the way out the door, um, the uh, uh, minutes from the last business meeting and the treasurer's report are on the back, and there's also some out here in the, in the uh, hallway out there. So please pick one up so that you, you uh, can be aware of what's, what's going on with the church. Um, following the business meeting at, at 6 p.m., we'll have a movie night tonight. Uh, the documentary, The Insanity of God, is, is going to be what we're watching. It's a, you can read the description there in the bulletin, but it's, it's, it's a, a precious movie, a challenging movie, an uplifting movie. Uh, your, your emotions will be engaged tonight, I can tell you that much. But, but by all means, you, you come, you invite, invite friends to come. Um, I just let you know, it, it is intense. I think uh, it, it was rated PG-13 um, on the different streaming services you might see it on. Um, that's for intense scenes. I mean, it's, a, I mean there's, it, it's, it's talking about the persecution of Christians around the world, and so there's some scenes that are very intense. So you, uh, parents, you use your best judgment. Um, there will be nursery tonight um, uh, for that as well, so, so uh, you can keep that in mind if, if that's something that you choose to do. And... Um, also, want to let you know the running time is going to be about 90 minutes, about an, so it's roughly an hour and a half long. Um, so keep that in mind. But but I'm looking forward to it. It's it's, it's a it's a, a really good good movie that uh, will challenge us. Um, note there in the bulletin also budget requests. Uh, please turn them in by October fir- by October 1st uh, to the church office. So those things you can see the outline of the the schedule this week. Celebrate Recovery Monday. Uh, classical conversations will be going on here at the church on Tuesday. And then Esther Bible study starts back up this week on, on Wednesday morning at, uh, at 10, 10 a.m. So, so ladies, keep that in mind. And then Wednesday, our, our, our normal Wednesday activities, the Wednesday meal at 5.30, prayer service at 6.30 along with Missions Journey. Uh, this will be week number three for Missions Journey, so we're excited about that. Um, there's a note in there in the bulletin about uh, ladies, the, the T-shirts. You can pay attention to that. I think those are the announcements that I had to make. I don't think there's anything else. I'm looking forward to having a, a baptism at the end of the service today. We're excited to have Brother Jim come forward at, um, last week and just a, a precious time, a great testimony that he, he gave and, and uh, about how the Lord uh, saved him a number of years ago. And he had been baptized earlier when he was a kid, but he didn't, he didn't feel like that was, uh, that was the time that he, got, he really became a Christian, uh, that he became a Christian uh, back in 97. And he, hasn't, he hadn't been baptized in, in, in believer's baptism, so we're going to be doing that today. I'm very excited about that. Um, but if you will stand with me now as we, as we turn to, him, to uh, Psalm 13. I'm going back to my days leading music, starting to tell you to turn to, the, to, to hymn number 13, but we're looking at Psalm 13, and we stand in the, in the honor of the reading of God's word. How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long will I store up anxious concerns within me, agony in my mind every day? How long will my enemy dominate me? Consider me and answer, Lord my God. Restore brightness to my eyes, otherwise I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have triumphed over him, and my foes will rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your faithful love. My heart will rejoice in your deliverance. I will sing to the Lord because he has treated me generously. Let's pray. Lord God, we cry out to you today because we know that you hear us. We know that even in the conflicts and the the trials that we go through in this world, you are there with us. Lord, we know even right now as we think about Stacy and Aaron and we think about Marcia and the family, Lord, that you are right there with them. We thank you for the way you strengthen, you encourage. We thank you for the way that you have uh, provided a way of salvation, Lord. That, and, and Lord, we thank you that, uh, uh, that Stacy has that testimony of being a Christian. God, I pray that, uh, that you would just do a great work in their family this week. Lord, I pray that you would even, even bring Stacy back to health, Lord. What a blessing that would be. Lord, we trust you with all of it. And uh, Lord, I, I just uh, thank you as we think about September 11th yesterday. We think about 20 years since that that horrible day. 
But Lord, we know that you have been at work. You, you were at work even there in New York City and Pennsylvania and Washington, D.C. On that, on that day. And Lord, you've been working ever since. Lord, we thank you for all those who served on that day. And we thank you for all who served in the military and, and down through the, the two decades since then, Lord, in defense of our nation. Lord, we just uh, give you praise and honor and glory for them. Uh, thank you, Lord, for the freedoms that we have in this nation. God, I pray that today as we, as we uh, open up your word here in a few minutes, Lord, as we sing here in just a moment, Lord, I pray that you would be exalted in our hearts today. Lord, you deserve glory, honor, and praise because you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Yes. As we're going to talk about here in just a moment, Lord, you are sovereign over all your creation. You are in control. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you in all things. Thank you that, that Jesus died upon the cross for, your, for our sins and rose from the dead. It's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing. our country's headed it's real easy to be fearful um, but we don't have to be that fearful we have an anchor in Jesus and he holds us still in the in the winds and you know the the term fear not is mentioned maybe not directly like that but is several times in the Bible it's everywhere he's always telling us do not fear like in Isaiah 41 10 says fear not for I am with you be not dismayed for I am your God let's sing fear not
night For I am with you tonight For I am with you tonight For I am with you such a dark Fear not For I am with you tonight For I am with you seated for a few minutes. Hannah's going to come down and name some missionaries from all over the world and then lead us in a prayer over them. Our missionaries for today are in Florida, Christopher Kunet, Kentucky, Ugandi Avila Afanti, Maryland, Mark Wright, Massachusetts, Robert Murkowski, American Peoples, Don Friesen, and Rick Thompson, Central Asian Peoples, BM, EM, and TW, East Asian Peoples, Adria Fleming and SJ, European Peoples, CB and SM, Northern African and Middle Eastern Peoples, DB, JG, OL, and RP, South Asian Peoples, DC, Southeast Asian Peoples, JB and MS, along with our chaplains, volunteers, state commission missionaries, and retired missionaries. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift these missionaries up to you today, Lord. I just pray that you would just fill them with your spirit and that you would give them encouragement and guidance. Lord, I pray that you would just um, give them health and protection and that you would just not let Satan attack them today. Lord, I pray that you would open doors for them to share the gospel with those who need to hear it. Lord, I pray that you would open hearts to receive the gospel through them so that your name might be glorified, Lord. Father, I pray that we would be faithful in sharing the gospel with those around us so that your name might be glorified to the ends of the earth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Gentlemen, if I could get four of you to come up and help with the offering plates this morning, please. If you're choosing to give, you can also go to uh, RotomaParkBaptist.net and give online that way. Um, if you're a visitor, you should have a visitor's card in front of you. Just let that be your gift to us. Brother Craig, will you please bless the offering?
If you'd please stand, let's sing one more song before we get a message from God's Word. Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Exodus chapter 7. Exodus chapter 7. Um, 
started a series last week called God Is, and we'll be looking at the attributes of God over the next several weeks. Last week we talked about the fact that God is eternal. God is eternal, but this week we're going to be talking about the fact that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. So Exodus chapter 7, we'll read the first five verses here, and then we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Exodus chapter 7, of course this is the story of Moses and Pharaoh. Verse 1, the Lord answered Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and Aaron your brother will be your prophet. You must say whatever I command you. Then Aaron your brother must declare it to Pharaoh, so that he will let the Israelites go from his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh will not listen to you, but I will put my hand into Egypt and bring the military divisions of my people, the Israelites, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the Israelites from among them. Let's pray together. Lord God, we just come. Lord, right now I just pray that we would all come to your feet confessing sins. Lord, just uh, asking your forgiveness, Lord, asking your cleansing right now, asking, Father, today that you would uh, open up our, our hearts, open up our eyes to see you, open up our ears to hear your word, to hear your word clearly. Lord, help me to preach your word faithfully. I pray, Lord, that you'd be lifted up and exalted in every heart in this place. Lord, so that when we leave this place today, Lord, we would know that you are sovereign, that you are the God who is in control of all things. And Lord, I know that that's comforting, Lord, but it also is very convicting. Lord, I pray that your spirit would do whatever needs to be done here among us. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This time of year is always um, a time of reflection as we think about yesterday being September 11th. And um, many of you have heard me talk about this before, but uh, September 11th happened two days after I was ordained as a pastor back in, in 2001, and it was the first month that I was a pastor. And so really one of the first sermons I ever preached as a pastor was the aftermath. You know, it would have been, so September 11th that, that year was a, was a Tuesday. Uh, so September 16th, I would have gone into the pulpit there at the church in Ohio that I pastored for about 12 years. And, and here I am, just this young green kid, trying to make heads or tails of what had just happened that week and having the same questions that everybody else had, right? And I don't remember all the details of what I preached that day, but what I, what I, what I ultimately went into, into the pulpit with was something along the lines of Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, the idea that God is busy working all things together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. And I can't tell you all the reasons that God allowed the events of September 11th to happen? I don't know the answer to that. There, there are some mysteries that, we'll, that will always be beyond us. I don't know why God allows any of the evil that he allows. But I do know that God is doing exactly what he says in Romans 8.28. I know that God is in control. He is sovereign. And that word sovereign, you know, we think about it uh, in, in, in the terms of a, of a monarchy, of a king, of a kingdom. He is the ultimate king. He is the ultimate sovereign. He is the sovereign Lord that we must bow to. He is doing a work, and he has the right to do that work any way that he chooses. If you've never recognized that right, today is the day to do that. If you've never recognized that he has the right to do that, today is the day to bow your, your heart before him and say, Lord, I yield to your lordship over my life. I yield and I recognize your sovereignty over my life and over the events of all men and women. Sovereign means that he is king. It means that he is the one who gets to make the laws and ultimately governs eternally by them. He meets out eternal justice. He, he meets out eternal mercy. 
and so on and so forth. But I will say this, when we talk about the sovereignty of God, I want to give a word of caution. God is not only sovereign. He is sovereign. But he is not only sovereign. Just like we talked about last week, that he is eternal. He is not only eternal. And so every time we talk about one of the attributes of God, we have to understand it in the context of everything else that God is. So if, you, if all you ever heard was the fact that God is sovereign, you might think of him much like you think of one of the, one of the Roman emperors, who was very much in control and in charge of the empire, that they, the Roman empire back in those days. But, but you have to understand that those were wicked men, wicked rulers, Human rulers, so by definition they would have been wicked, but, the, but even the Roman emperors were, were wicked in many ways beyond what normal human leaders would be. So we understand that God is not only sovereign, and we need to understand this attribute in tension with all of his other attributes. For example, the fact that God is also very loving. So if you understand God's sovereignty without the love of God, you might get a very skewed view of who God is you would get a very skewed view of who God is. That he is, all, he is very severe and cold. And he is in charge, but that's all that he is. But then you also understand that he is a good God and a loving God, and it makes you understand and appreciate his sovereignty all that much more. We don't understand any of these attributes in a vacuum. We understand them in connection with everything else we know about God. But today we're going to zero in on the fact that God is sovereign. And we need to understand that this is not something that we should be afraid of. We should understand it. We should appreciate it. It should bring conviction to our lives, but it should also bring great encouragement to our lives. Because here's the good news, brothers and sisters. If God is in control, guess what? I don't have to be. And guess what? If I'm in control, we're all in a mess. If you're in control, and a lot of you are a lot smarter than I am, a lot of you are are a lot better people than I am, but if you're in control, we're still in trouble. (laughs) But if God is in control, God who is all-powerful, God who is also good, God who is also loving, now we're getting somewhere. This is where we need to be. And so as we look at a world that seems like, frankly, everything is out of control at times, We understand that God is not surprised by a bit of it. We talked about that last week, the idea that he is eternal. But his his eternality combined with the fact that he is ultimately sovereign. It gives us great comfort as we move forward. So as we look at this this passage in Exodus chapter 7, we're going to get to some of the the, the concepts of, of, of of his sovereignty in this story of Moses going back repeatedly to Pharaoh. And ultimately, the plagues come to Egypt. And we're going to talk about the fact that, and how God interacted with, with Pharaoh. But I wanted to make a few, a few understand, or give a few understandings of, of what's happened here leading up to this event. Generally speaking, understand that God makes choices, and he has the right to make choices. He sovereignly makes choices. And I want to talk about a few choices that he's made leading up to this event in, in Exodus chapter 7. First of all, God chose Abraham... And ultimately, therefore, he chose Israel to be his chosen people. He chose Abraham to be ultimately the father of his chosen people, Israel. He chose Abraham because, anybody know? Just because, right? We don't know anything beyond that. He chose Abraham out of a group of of, of, of pagan, uh, pagan people there in the aftermath of the Tower of Babel. Abraham, Abraham, or he was known as Abram in those days, was not somebody who sought after God. He was wealthy, he had, you know, his family had many possessions, but, but that's about all we really know about him. So God chose Abram, as far as we know, just because he wanted to. We know nothing else about Abram that would cause him to choose Abram. Secondly, we know that God worked through great hardships the, the great hardships of Joseph to bring Israel down to Egypt. So he chose to bring Israel down to Egypt, and in doing so, he had to work, or he didn't have to, but he chose to work through the great hardships that Joseph went through 
in the, in the latter part of the story of, of, of the book of Genesis. From Genesis chapter 37 through the end of the chapter, through the end of uh, chapter 50 of Genesis, we find that God allowed Joseph to go through tremendous hardship at the hands of his brothers, great injustices along the way, time after time, things were looking up for Joseph, then he ended up back in prison, and no, through no fault of his own. But God was busy doing that, all that, ultimately to position his people Israel down in Egypt. But also, as we learned at the end of, 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 at the end of Genesis, he, he did that sovereignly to put Joseph in just the right position to have the wisdom to tell Pharaoh this, that there's going to be a great famine in the land, and many people were saved because of Joseph's wisdom, because God put Joseph in just the right place at just the right time. So we, we find that God sovereign, sovereignly chose to work through the great hardships of Joseph to bring Israel down to Egypt. Third, we find that God chose Moses to deliver Israel. He could have chosen somebody else, but he chose Moses. In fact, if, if we, we find the, the book of Exodus opens up with the story of the birth of Moses. And we find that God put Moses right where he wanted him to be. Even through the wickedness of that Pharaoh. Because if you remember chapter 1 of Exodus, there ultimately came a Pharaoh who didn't know Joseph. Because at the end of Genesis, the people of Israel are, are, are in great position. They're, they're uh, thought very favorably by Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. But one generation after another generation, hundreds of years pass until you find a Pharaoh who didn't care about Egypt, excuse me, about Joseph and about the people of Israel. And in fact, he saw Israel as a threat. So the wickedness rises up and he, he, they begin to kill children to try to thin out the population of the people of Israel. And we find the, the civil disobedience of the, of the midwives. And we find that God worked through that. God through, worked through so many different things in the early chapters of, of, of Exodus to bring Moses to, to this place at this time. Right up to the burning bush experience and ultimately. Now he is, he's here, he's an 80-year-old man. He's got a, a spokesperson, uh, Aaron, who's 83. And so these two elderly men are going to go and talk to Pharaoh and say, let God's people go. Fourthly, we find that God chose to raise up Pharaoh so that Pharaoh might glorify God. Let me repeat that. God chose to raise up Pharaoh so that Pharaoh might glorify God. This is a hard thing. Because I want us to understand that by the end of the book of Exodus, by the end of the story of this part of the book of Exodus, Pharaoh did glorify God. But not willingly. His judgment, ultimately, in itself, is a glory to God. And this is a hard thing. This is, this is the part that, of, of Scripture that sometimes will cut against our heart. Because God will be glorified one way or the other. We find in, Ephesians, excuse me, in Philippians chapter 2, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of things in heaven and things on the earth and things under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, does that mean that at the end of time, everybody's going to be saved? We know that that's not going to be the case. Some people will bow their knee willingly, and you must do it here on earth, or you won't do it there. And Some people will, do, will bow their knee unwillingly, because they, they are forced to recognize what they should have recognized here. And brothers and sisters, this is hard, a hard thing to think about. But Pharaoh, his life, even in his stubbornness, he did not willingly bow his knee to God. Although you find a few times where he's interested, or he's a little bit softer, but then he pulls away. So God chose, chose to raise up Pharaoh. He could have raised up anybody, but he chose this Pharaoh at this time, at this place, so that Pharaoh might glorify God. 
The fifth thing I want to talk to you about on this before we look at this verse. God chose to remove his hand from Pharaoh and allow him to have a hard heart. This is hard. God chose to remove his hand from Pharaoh and allow him to have a hard heart. I'm going to explain why I, why I phrased it that way here in just a few moments. But this, th- what we're talking about here in this aspect of, of God's dealing with Pharaoh is a doctrine of, of reprobation. And you heard, well, sometimes you'll hear in, in, in life, well, that person is just a reprobate. The idea of reprobation means that God has, has removed his hand from that individual. Now, we all go, th- we, everybody in the world today, guess what? The sun's going to shine on the just and the unjust, on those who are following Jesus and those who aren't following Jesus. So even those who don't know Christ are benefiting today from the sunshine. And we're expecting rain later on, perhaps. So, so they'll benefit from the rain, too. So there's a common uh, interaction that God has and a common blessing that, that hits everybody in the world. But then there's a special and unique dealing that God has with people that he chooses to interact with at specific times and specific places. There's a specific interaction that, that, that you experienced when you came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he, and he convicts you of sin. And he draws you to himself. And you choose to follow Christ. But then there are times and places and, and situations, and Pharaoh is one of these people we find in Scripture, where their conscience is pricked, and they can see that God probably exists, and God probably is, uh, is right, and I should be probably following God, but they just run right through the stop sign, and there's a blow right through it, and ultimately their conscience becomes seared. God gives, us, God gives everybody a conscience. It's the law that's written upon our heart, we find in, in Romans chapter 2. The law is wrote, written on every one of our hearts. His law. And sometimes we listen to it and we might obey it and sometimes we don't. And because we don't even once, we're condemned to be separated from God in eternity in a place called hell. And something needs to be done and Christ has done that and we we talk about that on a regular basis. But we're going to find this in this story here and I I just read uh, the first five verses of chapter 7. This interaction between Pharaoh and Moses... And God would tell Moses, you go and you tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And you perform these signs and wonders in front of him. And some of those things, his, uh, 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 Pharaoh's magicians would be able to, to duplicate or at least seemingly, seemingly duplicate. And Pharaoh would say, you know what, that's not a big deal. I got that covered. So your God must not be all that powerful. And we find in the next few chapters, chapters 8, 9... And 10, and even, even on in chapter 11, we find the interactions of Moses and Pharaoh. And, and, and many of these cases, I'll read a couple of these here. Moses, or Pharaoh would step right up to the point of maybe believing, maybe thinking about it, and he'd back off. Let's read a couple of these chapters, a couple of these interactions here. Um, at the end of chapter, uh, chapter 8, This is following the plague of frogs. Actually, the middle of chapter 8, verse 14. They piled them in countless heaps. This is after they were dead, after these frogs were dead. And there was a terrible odor in the land. But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, he hardened his heart and would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Notice the Pharaoh hardens his heart is how it's described here. Now, if you remember back in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, excuse me, it says that, that, that uh, God would harden his heart. These first several plagues, it's mostly either his heart became hard or Pharaoh, his, Pharaoh's heart was hard. Uh, that's in verse uh, 19 of chapter 8. Or in verse 12, excuse me, verse 32 of chapter 8, the very last verse. But Pharaoh hardened his heart this time also and did not let the people go. 
And so you see some interest from Pharaoh at times. But then it says he hardened his heart. But then later on, we find something else. We get to, to the plague of darkness over in chapter 10. And this happens a few, multiple times. This phrase. After the plague of darkness, at the end of chapter 10, look at verse 27. It says, But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was unwilling to let them go. Pharaoh said, said to him, Leave me, make sure you never see my face again, for on the day you see my face you will die. As you have said, Moses replied, I will never see your face again. And if Pharaoh at any point along the way had turned, had repented of his pride, of his arrogance, and turned to the Lord, he would have been spared, and more importantly, his firstborn would have been spared as we get to chapter 11, because the last plague is the worst of all the plagues. And it says there was a cry in Egypt because of this plague that had never been heard before and has never been heard again because of this plague, the, the death of the firstborn. And we see the Passover that comes in where the, the people of Israel are commanded specifically to, to sacrifice a lamb, to place the, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts and over, and over, the, and over the, the heading of the door. And the angel of death would pass over the entire region. And anybody who had the blood of the lamb on the doorposts, the angel would pass over that, that home. But anybody, and this would have been Jew or Egyptian, who did not have the blood on the doorposts, they would have had their firstborn son die. All because Pharaoh in the condition of his heart. And what was the condition of his heart? As I said, God chose to remove his hand from Pharaoh and allow him to have a hard heart. Why do you think I say that? That he removed his hand from Pharaoh. Because you have to understand this. Pharaoh was not a believer in the one true God. Okay, He never was. He had heard... Because the Hebrews were around, he had heard about the God of Joseph, he had heard those stories, but he had no regard for Joseph, because he had reached a point, and the generations had reached a point where they, it was just so, such a distant memory, Joseph was. So he is, you have to understand, the Pharaoh thinks of himself as God, the one true God. He has placed himself in that position. And the people look at him as such. And he loves that adoration and that worship that the people of Egypt gave to him. And so what he has to deal with as, as Moses comes and, and says, let my people go, what he is doing, he is going to have to recognize that God is God and he is not. And that would, that would occur to him sort of in some spots. And you can see God working with him. But then he backed away. Time and time and time again. And God's judgment would come. Ten plagues, the last one being horrendous, hit Egypt because Pharaoh would not turn to God. Understand today, brothers and sisters, Never underestimate the ability of the human heart to explain away God and to not submit to his lordship and to his sovereignty. Never underestimate. And, and you think, well, I am so much smarter than my neighbor. No, you are not. No, you are not. In fact, if God had not intervened in my life, I would have been just as wicked and just as prideful and just as everything as Pharaoh was with a whole lot less people worshiping me. But, but you get the picture, right? <laughs> but I want us to, to compare this passage 
And you know, you, you know, take time. If, you know, I, I would encourage you to take time and read the full story from Genesis, excuse me, from Exodus 7 through all the way through 11 and find how God delivered. But I want us to also read a passage from the New Testament that, that teaches the very same concept. And I would submit this morning, you're going to see some, read some things from Romans chapter 1 that you're going to say, well, wait a second, are you describing our current culture? And I'm going to say probably so. Romans chapter 1, verses 24 through 32. And I want you to see a specific phrase that comes up three times in this text, which I think also very, very keenly describes what happened with Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. Romans chapter 1 in the New Testament in verse 24. Therefore God delivered them over in the desires of their hearts to sexual impurity, so that their bodies were degraded among themselves. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served what was created instead of the Creator who is praised forever. Amen. For this reason, God delivered them over to disgraceful passions. Their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. The men in the same way also left natural relations with women and were inflamed in their lust for one another. Men committed shameless acts with men and received in their own persons the appropriate penalty of their error. And because they did not think it, was, it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind so that they do what is not right. They are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness. They are full of envy. Murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Although they know God's just sentence that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them but even applaud others who practice them. And I want you to see there and this is in the context of the earlier part of chapter 1. The earlier part of chapter 1 talks about the fact that, that God, in his amazing and powerful creation, his invisible attributes are made known. And what he is teaching there, and he says, because his invisible attributes are, are made known by the amazing majesty of his creation... Uh, I mean, the, the amazing things we see uh, as we look up at the night sky, the amazing things that we see in the mountains, in the, in the oceans, just the, the tremendous glory that is revealed in his creation. Because of this, Paul says in Romans 1, they are without excuse. In other words, this should be enough to cause men and women everywhere to cry out to God and say, God, I want to know you. God, I was created for you. And it should, cause, it should cause all of us to reach out and say, I need to know this God. Even if we didn't have the Bible, his nature, his creation should cause us to reach out to him. But Paul says it does not. They do not. And not just, not just they do not, but it says they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they Push it down so that people can't find out. So that I can't find out, you can't find out, and most importantly, they don't have to deal with it. And so they push it down, just like somebody stepping on a trash can to get it to go down so that so you can put more trash in it, right? That's just what they're doing. They're suppressing it. They're pushing it down. And that's the context in which you know, we find in 23, 22, 23, claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images uh, resembling mortal man, birds, four-footed animals, and reptiles. Paul is describing the, the pantheon, the Roman gods that the people of Rome are worshiping. And they would take a, a human characteristic, they would mix it with an animal, <laughs> and they would, they would combine all of these things, and they would bring... God down to human level. And all the different Roman gods were very similar to that. The Greek gods as well, but we're talking about Rome. And Paul says, because of all of that, did you hear the phrase? Did you see the phrase three times in what we read? Therefore, God delivered them over. 
For this reason, God delivered them over. Because they did not think it worthwhile to acknowledge God, God delivered them over to a corrupt mind. What he is describing is exactly what happened to Pharaoh in the book of Exodus. And what what he's saying is, he's not making them sin. God did not make Pharaoh sin. He did not cause Pharaoh to hold the people of Israel back. What he allowed for a time is he just took his hand off. Because the only restraining grace that was going on in, in, in Egypt in those days was the fact that God was holding Pharaoh back. And for a time, God would release his hand. And then he would deal with him. And then God would release his hand. And then God would deal with him. If Pharaoh had responded in any of those situations when God was dealing with him, all of that could have been washed away or stopped in any, in any step along the way. But God, as judgment upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt, God took his hand away. And what does that mean for the folks that we're talking about here in Romans 1? Do not miss this. And I'm going to say this as lovingly as I can, but as firmly as I can. What you find in Romans chapter 1, beginning with about, what, verse 20 or so, all the way down through the end to the end of chapter 1 of Romans, you find a description of a society that is completely out of control. And God, whatever restraining grace has been in the culture, he is removing his hand from many people. And you say, well, how does he decide? I don't know how he decides. It's really not my business how he decides. God is the only one who gets to choose that because God is sovereign. He is the one who's in control. But as you look at this, we find nonstop in these, in these chapters, in these, in these uh, verses, the LGBTQ stuff that we see today. It's, it's from verse 24 all the way down through verse, uh, verse 27, 28. But brothers and sisters, that's not the only thing we see. <laughs> There's a whole lot of stuff in verse 28 and following. Now that may have been one of the primary things that was happening. I don't know. We don't know, but I, I'm going to tell you right now, and I've, I've mentioned this from the pulpit before, and if you don't believe me, you need to wake up. You will be forced to make a choice in the future, and that day is probably coming sooner than you've ever realized it was. What you really believe about homosexuality and about the LGBTQ agenda, you're going to be forced to make a decision. I would suggest you make it now, if you haven't already. Not that you hate people, not that you want people to be be destroyed or any of that nonsense. No, you want them to be redeemed. You want them to to turn away from their sin. You want them to be turned away from the nonsense of multiple, more than two genders. What kind of nonsense is that? That's, That's not nonsense, that's evil and it's wickedness. And we need to recognize it for what it is. We do live in a world where there is objective truth. Objective moral truth. And it's found in the word of God. Yes. Believe, <clears throat> I understand that, that there's a great deal of, of discussion uh, in, in our day and age. This week even talking about vaccination mandates and what have you. I don't really care. I'm not starting a discussion here about about what you believe on those things. But if you're in in favor and you say, well, I don't think that vaccination mandates are such a big deal. I'm going to ask you the question, what's it going to be next week? You might think one thing this week, but what's it going to be next week when they find your issue? And brothers and sisters, we need to draw closer to Christ and closer to each other than we ever have. Because what we find here in Romans chapter 1 is a description of our society. And what God has said in his word is he sovereignly, whenever he wants to, can remove his hand. From me, from you, from anybody. 
he will not remove his hand from his children. But what we're finding in our society, and just so we, we're clear on this, we're not only talking about homosexuality, we're talking about verse 29, those who are filled with all unrighteousness, evil, greed, and wickedness, full of envy, murder, quarrels, deceit, and malice. They're gossips. If you, if you are one who, who thinks that gossip's not a big deal, it's on the list. Slanderers, God-haters, arrogant, proud, boastful, inventors of evil. I think abortion when I think about that. Disobedient to parents, senseless, untrustworthy, unloving, and unmerciful. Brothers and sisters, there's a whole lot of things on that list. And, and maybe the LGBTQ stuff might, might have been what precipitated some of what, that. When God took his hand off. I don't know for sure. But it describes a wicked culture. And if you open up your eyes, what you're finding is left and right. Professing Christians. Just moving a little bit off center. A compromise here, a compromise there. Well, maybe, maybe this, maybe that. Brothers and sisters, stay firm on the word of God. Do not stay firm on what I tell you, the Word of God says. Stay firm on what the Word of God says. Your allegiance is not to me, your allegiance to God, and His Word is true. But He says you are delivered over, and that's the same thing as the hardened heart that we find in Pharaoh. God does not force someone to do evil, but He does pull away His divine influence. That's going to mean that at times... We may be sharing the gospel with someone who simply will not listen. That's not my job to be concerned about that. It's not my job. Uh, There are people I've shared the gospel with time and time and time again. And as long as they're breathing, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to keep sharing the gospel with them. But do understand the way God works. And I I would include this, especially the longer a person rejects the gospel, I would include this This kind of concept that God is not guaranteed to give you another opportunity. God is not guaranteed to to say, you know what, I will bear with you forever. He has not said that he would do that. There does come a time, and sometimes that time does even come months, even years, before that person actually dies. God is sovereign. But I want to say this, and I started talking about this at the beginning of the message. God's choices ultimately result in good things for those who love God. God's choices ultimately result in good things for those who love God. This is why on September 11th, 2001, and you're watching the towers fall, you're watching all the news coverage of the of the. the plane in Pennsylvania and the plane that hit the Pentagon. Things are just spinning out of control. And yet we turn to Romans chapter 8. And we look at verse 28. And Paul says clearly, we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And there's a whole lot more and. There's a whole lot more we could talk about, about Pharaoh, even in Romans chapter 9, and how God dealt with, with, uh, with, with Pharaoh there. But make no mistake, what Paul is saying is that God has the right to deal with us however he wants to. But he also says, you know, you could, throughout, throughout this, this entire letter, which is, which is an amazing letter of you know, God's word, he also shows the goodness of God throughout the entire situation. And he shows that, that as you're watching the world fall apart, as you're watching hard things happen in past cultures, in our culture, he says all things work together. And he says we know this. In other words, there's a certainty that all things work together for the good. It's not coincidentally. The idea is that God is behind this. He is orchestrating and taking the wickedness of the world and turning it to some good result for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. Notice what he does not say. And it's implied, but it's there. 
is that this promise does not apply to those who do not love God. Ultimately, whatever God declares is good, and and those who receive the benefits of God working these things together are those who love God. But if you are in this place today and you do not love God, and you've never, you've never wanted to recognize his sovereignty over your life. Oh, you might want the, the, the forgiveness in the idea of going to heaven. But you don't want to yield control of your life to a sovereign Lord. Today is the day to recognize that God is busy working together for the, those things for good. For, but only for those who love God. Only for those who want him. I'm going to tell you, heaven is going to be a very, would be a very miserable place. For those who don't love God. It's going to be a glorious place for those who do love him. Because he is the attraction. He is the one that we want to, that causes us to want to go to heaven. So I'm going to ask a few questions here and and I'm going to talk about a few applications here. How does God's sovereignty affect us? I would say it affects us pretty much every way. (laughs) But I'm going to hit 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 a few high points here. How does God's sovereignty affect us? First of all, we know that we are not in charge. We know that we are not in charge. That is both comforting and convicting. Because if you're you're one that that does not like to let anything go out of your control, that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a hard thing to trust God, isn't it? But if you're one, even for that person who's trying to control you can step back and say, you know what? God is in control. What am I doing? But maybe you're one who, your personality type isn't that way, but you're much more laid back, and you understand that God's called you to recognize his sovereignty. And he's called you to do something, and we'll talk about that. Secondly, our choices are still meaningful our choices are still meaningful Uh, in other words the sovereignty of god does not wipe out the fact that pharaoh chose to do wrong pharaoh had a real choice every time that 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 moses came to him it was a real choice it wasn't a fake choice he didn't become a puppet puppet or a robot or anything like that we are not puppets we are not robots the bible does not teach that at all in fact what we find is the sovereignty of god and the will of man And the responsibility of man, they are held in complete tension throughout the word of God. I mean, you you do not see one without the other. God's sovereignty does not wipe out the choices that we make. But you better believe our choices do not wipe out God's sovereignty. And if you're going on down that road, that is completely wrong. I'm going to read a, a couple of verses to you from Matthew chapter 18. Because I want you to see that our choices are meaningful, even though there's sort of an inevitability to some of them, at least some, the, the fact that there's sin in the world. Uh, Matthew chapter 18, verses 6 and 7. It says, but whoever, this is in the context of who is the greatest. And Jesus has just talked to, um, he had just brought the child forward and, and says, whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me. In other words, you have to become like a little child. But look what he says in verse 6. He said, but whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to fall away, it would be better for him if a heavy millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depths of the sea. But look what he says in verse 7. Woe to the world because of offenses. For offenses will inevitably come, but woe to that person by whom the offense comes. What Jesus is saying is this. Because God has allowed this world to exist in such a way that evil could come into it. Going back to Genesis chapter 3. God knows that evil things are going to happen. Jesus knows he's going to the cross. He knows this in, in, in Matthew chapter 18. That's the very reason that he came. And he knows that he's going to be nailed to a cross. Because sinners are going to nail him there. But does that mean that he forced them to nail him to the cross? Absolutely not. They had to decide 
to nail him to the cross. The truth of the matter is, we must decide to follow Jesus. We must decide. We must place our faith and our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The invitation to salvation is a real invitation. It's a real invitation to make a meaningful decision. Now, you're making a foolish decision if you reject it. But many make that decision every day. But that, that passage in Matthew, Jesus says, offenses are going to come. Sin is going to happen. But everybody who commits sin is responsible for it. In other words, the inevitability of it cannot be blamed on God. It cannot be blamed on Satan. It cannot be blamed on anyone else. He says, but woe unto those by whom offenses come. Jesus holds us responsible because our choices are still meaningful. Third thing, third way that, it, that his sovereignty affects us, don't jump to conclusions. Don't jump to conclusions. You may be going through a hard time right now. You may be, you may be watching on the news and see a bad thing happen. And you immediately go into despair. You immediately go into, oh, no, there, there goes everything. Everything's over. Can I just tell you, I've been a, you know, I grew up, I'm an Ohio State Buckeyes fan. I watched it a, I watched it a lot less than I ever used to, right? And I'm a, but especially Ohio State, okay? The last thing I have ever wanted to do in my life is watch an Ohio State football game with, some, with another Ohio State football fan who is negative. I would rather do anything. Then any, any, time, any time they don't score a touchdown, oh, there goes the game. Oh, there it is. And I just say, wait, just wait. When you see something negative going on in the world, don't jump to conclusions. God is still in control. God has not lost it. But we do know this. We, we still might go through hardship, right? In fact, that leads to some of the things I'm going to be talking about now. The fourth application about how this affects us, God uses hard times to purify his people. God uses hard times to purify his people. You know, God, it always, it always feels better when we just see the commandment and we obey the commandment. <laughs> that's, that's the easy way. But which, which one of us have ever just learned the easy way? Most of us learn the hard way by experience some consequence for my sin and your sin, right? Most of us learn the hard way. Sometimes we, we learn the hard way and, and, and that, that helps us to grow and the next time we experience the same temptation, we're, we're better, and we're better, we're better able to overcome that. But you know, other things happen at times as well, and, it's not, and not everything bad that happens in our life is because of our sin. Sometimes God disallows bad things. I mean, Job hadn't done anything to deserve the things that happened to him, but God allowed Satan to harm him for a time, and it was painful. It was horrible what, what Job went through. <clears throat> but you read to the end of the book of Job, and what do you find? You find God taught Job a tremendous lesson. And this is the hard thing about the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God means that God is in control, and I need to trust him regardless of what happens. And that word regardless is a very hard word. Because when we say, I, I trust you, Lord, regardless of what happens, that means I'm recognizing that something really bad can happen. And we spend much of our time trying to make sure that nothing bad ever happens in our life. And there's some things that we should responsibly do, right? Try to prevent, if, there's, if I know I can uh, try to prevent something, I'll try to do that. But then we recognize, I can't prevent everything. I can't. 
I can't put fingers in every dike that's out there. Eventually the dam's going to break and I'm going to experience something hard. But rest assured that God, just like we said in Romans 8, 28, God uses hard times and hard things to purify his people. He has always done that. We're going to see that in spades tonight with the documentary, The Insanity of God. Last thing, and we know this, but when we're going through the hard times, it doesn't feel this way. The last thing is this, God wins in the end. In fact, God has already won. It's just a matter of it playing out for us in our lives. God is victorious. He is, he is king of kings. He is lord of lords. There is nothing that's going on in the world right now that freaks out God. Not a single thing. So the best thing for me and the best thing for you is to step back and stop freaking out. Take a breath and realize that God is sovereign. And God is good. And God loves us with an everlasting love. And if the greatest way that this applies to, to every person in here is if you have never trusted Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, today is the day to win the victory. To, to come over to the winning side. And the winning side is the side of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ won the victory at Calvary. He died upon the cross for our sins and rose from the dead. He, he showed his victory when he rose from the grave. He rose triumphantly. The next time we see Jesus Christ, he's going to be returning on a white horse. And if you, don't, if you doubt the, the doctrine of reprobation, turn to the end of Revelation and find out what, what the Antichrist and his minions and all the people who are on his side, what they do when Jesus returns. They don't back off. They go straight at him. And Jesus mows them down victoriously. Jesus is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he wins in the end. You need to submit your heart and your life to him today. He is a good God. He is a loving God. He is a gracious God. But you must bow your heart to him today and be saved. You don't work your way to heaven. Heaven is a gift. Just simply place your faith and your trust that Jesus Christ died upon your, on the cross for your sins and he rose from the dead. Place your life in his hands today and know that he is the only one who forgives and he will forgive you eternally. But any other way, you'll be separated. We're going to come to a time of invitation now this morning. As you dwell upon God's sovereignty, the fact that he's in control, I pray that this this message challenges you, but it also blesses and strengthens you for the, for the days ahead. I pray that God, God has called you and you will respond today to do something, maybe publicly, that you've never done before. Maybe you've never professed Christ as Lord and Savior of your life before a group like this. Today the Lord would have you to do so. Maybe you've never come forward to say, I, I want to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. We're going to have a baptism here in just a moment. Today is the day to say, I want to, I want to follow the Lord in baptism. I, I know I'm a Christian, but I need to follow him in baptism because he's commanded me to do so. Maybe you'd like to come and, and be part of our church and say, I, I want to unite with this church and be a part of what God is doing here. And we would love and rejoice about that. If there's something that I can pray with you about, I would love to do that. But whatever it is, this is a time to respond as God leads you to do so. You obey him as we pray. Father God, I thank you for the day that you've given us. And thank you, Lord, for the, the blessing of salvation. I thank you, Lord, for the testimony of baptism that we're going to have here in just a few minutes with Jim. Uh, Lord, what a blessing it is to, to hear how you've worked in his life over the last 20 plus years. Lord, please just help us. Draw us close to you. We know that you are in control. Hold on to us today. Hold on to our hearts. And Lord, if we're going through something hard Lord, help us to, to not fear, but, Lord, to trust in you. Help us to not walk away from you, Lord, and with a hard heart, but, Lord, soften our hearts today. Don't remove your hand from our hearts today, Lord. Please, Lord, the, the worst thing that could happen, Lord, would be for you to remove your hand from us. Lord, if somebody is experiencing conviction today, Lord, for their sin, Lord, help them to repent and turn to you. Whatever needs to happen, Lord, we just want to glorify you today. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.
stand together. Sunday night. You want to share with them? As most of you know, I grew up coming to this church and I was baptized when I was eight years old here um, with my twin Elizabeth, but I don't think that I fully understood the meaning of baptism during that time and really I feel like I did it just because Elizabeth was doing it. <laughs> and as the years have gone by and I've been through some struggles and I actually gave my life to Christ, I realized that I wasn't being obedient into what, I guess, baptism truly means and what it should really be used for. So I would like to get baptized next week in honor of that. Just <laughs> so I'm excited about that. So be here next week. But I've got business to do this week. So uh, thank you, Lily. God bless you. All right. All right.
Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. All right. So why don't you face out there for a minute. This is Jim Zumwalt. Jim, do you want to give a word of testimony about what the Lord's done in your life? Yes, I do. I, I, say I, was, I was thought I was saved as a young age. In, in matter of fact, in this church uh, as a kid when it was moved over to town. And, and uh, grew up and I wasn't saved. You know, I wouldn't, uh, did not make that turn. I, would, I did not give my life to the Lord. And I realized that in 1997. And... Uh, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a glory, it was a tough day, and it was a glorious day as well. I was mm -hmm. on my hands and knees crying. I asked the Lord to come to my heart, and He did. Amen. And that's when I was saved. Amen. And uh, since then, I have not been baptized. So that was 1997. Okay. Let's praise God. Praise God. Well, that's exciting for me. So. Me too. <laughs> well, Brother Jim, based on your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in the likeness of his death. There's towels down there for you. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's stand up together. It's great to see all of you today. Let's close with a word of prayer. Brother Andy, would you close in prayer, sir? Our Father, as we come to you this day, this glorious day, Lord, we want to put full trust in you. And Lord, I just pray for all the people that are uh, in sickness right now that you cure them, if it's your will. And Lord, just thank you for this glorious uh, day that we saw somebody come to you, Lord, and proclaim their faith in you. And Lord, as we all go out this day, I pray that you Thank you for your son who died on the cross, but the Lord rose again three days later. And Lord is our hope and our glory and our promise to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.